morning. So I think one of the most intimidating moments of my life that at least happens on a regular basis is the, the very pregnant pause after I walk up to somebody that I don't know and I say, hi, my name is Travis, and then I wait for their reaction. Are they going to uh, uh, like me? Are they not going to like me? Are they going to ask me something strange? Are they going to shun me? Uh, are they going to turn away? Is it going to be awkward, right? It's kind of like last week with the silent stuff. It was just awkward. Um, in fact, it's so awkward, I think most people have such a hard time with this. We have created what I consider to be the bane of humanity, the icebreaker, the icebreaker game. We've created this thing where you like find five people you don't know and like talk about your favorite color or everybody that likes blue, raise your hand and now you're in a group. Why? Why do we do that to each other? No one likes it. Let's just stay with our little people. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. Being around people that you don't know can be intimidating. Be, introducing yourself, getting to know somebody else, maybe more intimidating than, somebody, than you walking up to somebody and saying, hi, my name is, maybe it's being on the receiving end of that. Somebody coming up to you and being like, oh man, I got to talk. Some of you, the, the greatest uh, thing that the church has, has invented in the last 20 years is getting away from the standing up and, and greeting one another moment in the worship service. You're like, the introverts in here are like, yes. You know, you're all like, you're, you're singing the doxology internally. You're just really excited about it. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, while we like, some of us like getting to know people, it's still a, a leap. There's still sort of this interaction that has to take place. And one of the hardest interactions I think that we can have is interaction with God. Because God has come to us and he's revealed himself to us. And when I, when I sat down and I started working on this sermon, I wanted to write a sermon that would tell you how you could experience God. Here's three things that you can do so that you can experience God. And I realized, one, that's not a great method to go about writing a sermon. Two, God has revealed himself. God has spoken through scripture, through creation, and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He has spoken. And so God has approached us. He has broken the ice. He has come forward and he says, Hi, my name is Yahweh. And the awkward is largely on our end. The strange, the difficult, the, the hardness of that is largely on our end. So what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about looking at the last chapter of Job. How it is that when God sticks his hand out to us and reveals himself to us, we can take his hand and shake it and say, I'm so glad to meet you. Rather than being full of fear being full of worry, being full of, I don't really know what to do here. Uh, so we're going to be in the last chapter of Job. We'll, we'll bounce around a little bit, but not too much. Uh, Job 42 is where we're at. And we're going to respond through confession, through obedience, and through joy. Confession, obedience, and joy. So let's talk about confession first. Job chapter 42, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, okay, so a little, little pre, uh, filler information here. Job has been uh, shown the grand tour of all creation. He has been shown everything that God does, and now he's responding to what God has revealed to him. He says, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Then he quotes a question that God asked him. He said, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? And he answers that question. Therefore, I've uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. He quotes God again. Here and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. And he answers that question, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, therefore I despise myself and repent in ashes. So God has taken Job on this virtual tour of all creation. He's shown him uh, about all the work that he does, his majesty, his greatness, and Job responds with a confession. Now when we hear the word confession, we think an admission of guilt. That's a very narrow understanding of confession. It's one of the ways to understand it, but it's a narrow understanding. Confession is an admission. It's agreeing with somebody. So if you and I walk outside and you say, the sky is blue, I will confess that I agree with you that the sky is blue. I'm not guilty in that admission. I'm just agreeing with you. So Job admits, he confesses to certain things that are taking place. And this can give us structure as we engage with God, when we're reading scripture, when we're in worship, when we're in creation, ways that we can respond to God as he's revealing himself to us. The first is that we need to confess who God is. We confess who God is. Go back to 42 verse 1. 
Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So he's seen this virtual tour and this is his response, but this is not his first response. His first response is actually after the first round of this tour in chapter 40, verse 3. And Job says, then, a- then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account, and what shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. What's the difference between 42 and 40? In 42, he talks about who God is first. In chapter 40, he only talks about himself. So God reveals all this stuff to him, and all he can do is look at himself and be like, wow, I'm totally not okay right now. And God's like, close, that's part of the answer, but you're not entirely there. So let's look at some more stuff. Let's look at Leviathan and Behemoth, and let's talk about the majesty of these beasts and how they are created to give me glory. So oftentimes in our walk with Christ, we just go to him with things that we need or what we want. We go to God but we're self-focused. We go to God and we just talk about ourselves. We talk about who we are. We don't talk about who he is. We engage in Bible study, prayer, singing songs, meditation, fasting, whatever it is that you do, but you do it without worshiping. And one way that we talk about this in our church is we describe that as cultural Christianity. That's what that is. It's that I'm so focused on myself that I don't have time or the ability to focus on who God is and what God has done, and so I reflect on my own life. If you wonder whether or not you're where you are on the spectrum of follower of Jesus, cultural Christian, where you are in that, look at your prayer life. Who do you spend most of the time talking about? Is it you and your needs? Or is it who God is and the greatness of God? So the primary purpose of God revealing himself to us so that we can get to know him. If God wanted to, we would have no clue he existed. God could be like the ultimate hide-and-seek champion, the biggest and greatest thing in all the world, and nobody knows about it. But he's not that way. He's revealed himself. He's revealed himself through creation, through the word, and through his son, Jesus Christ. This is how he's shown himself to us. Is that everything there is to know about God? No, it's not, but those are the things that he has chosen to reveal to us through those means. And so our response when we see that should be, wow, God, you are so great. You are so good. I want want to talk to you about your righteousness and your holiness. I want to talk to you about your justice and your mercy. I want to talk to you about your grace. I want to about your love. And the more and more you grow in Christ, the more and more you will talk to him about him. And the less and less you'll talk to him about yourself. We ask a question around here is one of the ways that we talk about discipleship. What is God saying? What is God saying? What is God saying? It's a great question. And I would say as you're working through maybe a personal devotion, even as you're working together through connect group or something like that, don't just stop at asking what is God saying. Refine that a little bit more at points and say, what is God saying about himself? Because that's the point of this book, is to tell you who God is and what he has done. So we confess who God is, but we also confess who we are. We don't stop at just who God is. We do need to talk about ourselves at some point. Look at verse 3. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. So God has shown him all this stuff, the amazing things in all of creation. And Job says, I see it. I know what I saw, and I still don't get it. It's like when I go to the mechanic. My dad sometimes tells me, like, just, just go out there with them while they fix it to make sure they're doing everything right. And I'm like, Dad, <laughs> you got a lot of faith in me. for some, and I don't know. They could be, like, destroying my car, and I wouldn't know it until the very end. Like, I'm just not educated that way. I don't understand what they're doing, even if I did sit there and watch them. Job admits something about himself. He admits that he's not God. And this is called being humbled. And it's a good thing. In our society, we talk about being humbled as a negative thing. Maybe it's the influence of Greek tragedies in our life because being humbled seems like a bad thing. If you're walking around every single day and you think you're less than other human beings and you're not equal with them, that they're better than you, that's a bad thing. We're all made in the image of God. Everybody's equal. 
But if you walk around thinking you're equal to God, ooh, that's not a good thing. We are the created. He is the creator. We have to have a proper perspective of that relationship. It is important that we be humbled. You will never follow Christ if you do not think that you need to follow him. If you are not humbled, you will not be dependent upon him. And if you're not dependent upon him, you will not look to him for salvation. You will think you can earn it on your own. And if you don't think you can, if you think you can earn it on your own, there's no real point to Christianity. There's no point to following Jesus. We have to be humble. And so when we meet with God, when we spend time in his word or, or with his people, when we meet with him, we need to confess who we are. And the Lord's Prayer talks about this. The first, I, I, which is amazing, he starts by saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You talk about who God is. Then you talk about who you are. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. There's a good structure there. We confess our needs. We confess our wants. We confess our desires. We confess areas where we've messed up. It's an important part of spending time with God. It's an important way to respond to him. So we confess who he is, we confess who we are, and we confess that we're satisfied. We confess our satisfaction. Verse 4, here and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of your ear, but now my eye sees you, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job is satisfied, which I think is cool. God has shown up in the whirlwind. God has asked all these questions of him. Job has asked all these questions of him beforehand. And Job kind of sits back and says, God, your presence is good enough for me. In fact, it's what Job's been looking for this whole time. He doesn't really get an answer as to why everything happened to him, at least at this stage. We don't read about it. He doesn't know that God and Satan sort of had this uh, cosmic debate and he was a, 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 an exhibit in that debate. He doesn't know about that. He doesn't find out why God has done all this. He doesn't even really find out that he's going to get all of those things back yet. But he just says, I've heard of you, but now I've seen you. And I'm going to shut up now. I'm going to be quiet now because that's enough for me. Job doesn't speak again in the rest of the book. He's satisfied. He's satisfied. When you meet with God, you should also be satisfied. Not in necessarily an answer he gives you. Not in, in, a, in, in the silence that maybe you feel. But be satisfied in that you are meeting with him. Be satisfied with him. Because when you finally see God, you realize that ultimately he is the answer you're looking for. If you think about every single topic we've covered in the study of Job this year, or this, this month, They've all come back to God being the center of it all, God being the answer. The first week, we talked about heaven and earth. We talked about God being ruler of both and in control and in charge, and so we worship him for it. Second week, we talked about good and evil, and what we came to the conclusion that God is good and God uses evil to bring about his purposes for our good and his glory. And then we talked about questions and answers. The big question on everybody's mind, why, God, why has this happened? And we realized that the answer to that is God. God is the answer as to why. God is the answer to the deepest fears, concerns, anxieties, worries that you have. It is God that you're looking for in those. When we talked about man and God, we realized that God is the creator. We are the created. And if we want to find out what we're supposed to do in the world, we have to orient ourselves to who God is and let him tell us what we do and who we are, not the other way around. And then noise and silence. God speaks in the noise and in the silence. God is always the answer. If you re receive nothing else from this sermon series, my hope is that you get that God has to be enough. That's kind of the impetus behind all this. Satan walks up to God and says, Job worships you because you give him stuff. And the challenge put before you is, is that really the case? Is that why you worship God? Is because he gives you things. And we come to the end of the book and Job is satisfied. Because that's not the case for Job. And I hope, my prayer is, that's not the case for you. 
Whatever your hurt, whatever your insecurity, whatever your fear, whatever your worry, whatever your identity crisis is that you go through, and we all go through them, you have to ask yourself, is God enough? Am I satisfied with God? And if not, there are things that maybe you need to work out of your life that are keeping you from being satisfied in him. So when God comes up to us and says, hi, my name is Yahweh, and I'd like to talk to you for a little bit, the first thing we do is we confess. We confess who he is, we confess who we are, and we confess that we're satisfied with whatever interaction God gives us there. Then we respond in obedience. We respond in and with obedience. Look at verse 7 of chapter 42. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So God is, uh, Job may be satisfied, but God is not. God is not happy with the way things have turned out, and there are some loose ends that he needs to tie up, namely three of them. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. I'm not going to make any jokes this week. They are blue sins, and God's going to tie them up as well. And he gives them basically things to do. He gives them two things to do. In Job, he gives one thing to do in order to tie up these loose ends. And it gives us some structure for understanding how we might respond to God in obedience as well. Now, you might think to yourself, well, Travis, why do I have to obey God? Like, I thought he was gracious, and so I thought, like, Jesus' death covers my sins, so I don't really need to obey. Yeah, that's not entirely true. You're right about one thing. God is gracious. And that's one of the reasons why we obey. We obey because of his grace. Look again at verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. And again, you're probably thinking, Travis, where are you getting grace out of this? God's angry at them. Yeah, God's angry at them, but the gracious part is that he tells them that he's angry. Have you ever been with somebody, friend, spouse, significant other, and you know they're mad, but they won't tell you why? Maybe that's more intimidating than an icebreaker game, trying to figure out, what did I do wrong? I'm sorry, what for? Everything? <laughs> I don't know. Tell me. God tells them that he's angry, and he tells them why. And God could have done this a lot of ways. He could have said to Job, hey, Job, I need you to go over there and talk to your three friends and let them know that they need to get right. But no, he actually directly addresses them. So Job isn't the only one who gets to speak with God. The three knuckleheads do as well. Larry, Merle, Curly, and Moe all get to have a conversation with God too. And you know what's funny? God in his grace tells them exactly what to do to be right with him. And this is gracious. God has spoken to each of us. God has shown us. He has graciously revealed himself. And I've said this before, creation, scripture, through Christ, God has shown himself who he is. He has spoken. He's not kept silent. And God doesn't have to do that because we have all done things wrong. We are like the three friends. We have said things and understood things wrongly about God and who he is. I have misspoken about who God is. And without sounding too harsh, that's blasphemy. To say things about God that are not true is blasphemy. So technically, God doesn't have to do that. His wrath can burn against me, but God is gracious, and he has told me, hey, these are, this is who I am, and you need to speak in accordance with who I am. And it's gracious that he has let me know that there are things that I can do to violate his will and his desire for my life. That is a gracious thing. That's not a, that's not a harshness. That's not a cruelty. But we have become so used to reading Scripture especially those of us that grew up in the church. You're so used to reading the word of God that you often forget that God is telling you about himself because heaven forbid, sometimes we think we already know it all. It's like, yeah, God, I know, I know that about you. And we are like Job, we speak, but we didn't know what we were talking about. So God is gracious, and so we obey because of his grace because he's told us about himself and about what he wants for us. But we also obey because he's made a way for us. He's made a way for us. Look at verse 8. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. I like that he reiterates that twice. 
you didn't speak rightly. God gives Eliphaz and his three friends things that they are supposed to do, ways for them to respond in obedience to him. They give him a way for them to be right with him. And if you're looking for a good Old Testament analogy for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I can't find one much better than this verse. Because God tells them to make sacrifices. You don't have to make sacrifices. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. He died because you were supposed to die. That was your punishment that he took. And he raised to life again because God accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. And now Jesus stands before the throne of God, interceding on our behalf. And interceding is one of those big church words that basically means he's vouching for you 24-7. You're with him. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on your cross for your sins, if, you are, if you're doing, if you're following the way that Jesus has told you to believe, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We have to take that on faith. But many of us, aren't like Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. They do exactly what God tells them to do. God has said, you will know me and you will receive salvation through my son and through no other way. We would be like, a, like an alternate history Eliphaz who would say, you know what, I don't really want to go to Job because we just spent like the last 40 chapters making fun of him and that's really humbling. So what I'm going to do is, rather than just like seven animals of each, I'm going to give like 14 and God will like that better. And so what we do is we're like, oh, I'm not going to go and like pray and put all my faith in Jesus. I'm going to try and earn God's forgiveness by being a good person. I'm going to sacrifice more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to do more. Y'all, that's not how God has told us to do it. So if that's what you're doing, if that's your approach to being right with God, here's the problem with that. You're disobeying. Even in that, you're disobeying. And you're not being humble. We have got to take God at his word, where he says that Jesus Christ died for you and for me, and to have faith in him is how you have a relationship, how you take the hand of God and you say, God, I'm glad to meet you. Because outside of that, there is no, God, I'm glad to meet you. Christ died so that we can have a good healthy relationship with God the Father. And so we respond to the way that he has told us about himself and the way he's told us to come into a relationship with him. And then we obey to show that we're following him still. Verse 9. So Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So this is the one thing that Job had to do. Job had to pray on behalf of his friends. Now, if I was Job, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it, but I would definitely milk it for all it was worth. <laughs> Be like, guys, I'm cool with that. Oh, I'm happy to pray for you, but might I remind you that I am now destitute and have nothing. So what are you going to give me to pray on your behalf? You're giving God seven and seven. What do I get? Maybe two and two? I don't know. Or I might say, yeah, I'll get there, but let me tell you all the ways that I was right and you were wrong. Job's a better person than I am. Job is righteous. And he shows that he's righteous by not doing those things. He shows that he's satisfied with God. He shows that he's satisfied with God defending him, because that's what God is doing. The loose ends are God coming and telling, that's why he says, you're not, uh, you haven't spoken of me like my servant Job has. That's a subtle dig to be like, y'all were wrong, and Job was right. By the way, let me remind you again that y'all were wrong, and Job was right. God is advocating on behalf of Job, and Job is satisfied with that. And so it's easier for him to pray on behalf of the people that were giving him a hard time. He's obeying what God has told him to do. It's obeying it. So when you experience God, when you spend time with him, when you have a devotion or you hear from him in, in worship, wherever it is that you might hear from him, there might be something that he wants you to do. And the way that you show that you are walking with him is that you respond in obedience. You say, yeah, I'm on that, God. Cool, I can do it. Yeah, that stinks, but I'm going to do it. Yeah, that's going to be hard, but I'm going to do it. Lord, I'm not sure I'm understanding you correctly. Can you make that a little clearer? Okay, cool, I'm going to go do it. Obedience is how we show God that we love him. And at the, at the risk of 
scaring you with that. God wants us to love him and love other people. That is what God wants us to do. The greatest of the commandments is love God, heart, mind, soul, and strength. Loving others as yourself is the second greatest commandment. Everything kind of falls into those categories. That's what he wants you to do. So if you want to give God a big old hug around his neck, do what he tells you to do. Respond in obedience. Now at the, at the close of that, that can kind of sound a little maybe dogmatic, maybe a little unfeeling. That may be fair. But that's not all we do. We, we confess who God is, we, we obey what he's told us to do, and then we respond with joy. We respond in joy. Look at verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job has everything given back to him. He has got his life restored to him. And oftentimes we focus on the material aspect of what God gets, but or what Job gets. But God has given him more than just material things. God didn't just uh, give him things. He gave him uh, a series of things. And this is things that we, these are things that we can find comfort in as well. So the first thing he gives him is comfort. And so we find joy in the comfort of God. Verse 11, Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him, and each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. I don't know where they've been for the last 41 chapters, but they're here now. Maybe that's like some of our families, right? Oh, uh, everything's over. Okay, cool. Here we are to help. We'll go back home now. Thanks. But we have joy in the comfort of God. Now, God is not here in the whirlwind. And and because we're reading this over the course of like five verses, it seems like Job gets everything back immediately. I don't think that's how this happens. I think this happens over time. And so God is not still standing there in the whirlwind for the next like 70 years. God has appeared in the whirlwind, he's spoken, and now he's left. And the way that he's comforting Job is through his people. The people are coming to comfort Job. And if you want to feel the comfort of God today, you need to be with his people. If you feel cut off from God, one, that might be sin in your life. Two, that might be that you don't have a relationship with God. But three, it might be that you're not with other people that believe in Christ that are trying to follow him. So if you need comfort, let me ask you, are you in a connect group here? Do you meet with other believers regularly? Because if you don't, if this is all you do, this big worship service that we have here, no wonder you don't feel comforted. You're anonymous. We don't know you. We can't comfort you because we don't know who you are. Do you go serve with other believers? Because even though you're working with other people and maybe you need the service, serving with other believers helps us to to be shoulder to shoulder. And it gives great opportunities for us to talk to each other about the difficulties we're running into. And so we can share and we can talk. Are you with God's people and are you being known by them? Because if you're not, you're not going to feel that comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 tells us, we have been comforted with a comfort from God so that we might comfort others. The church is designed to give comfort to its members. It's what we're supposed to do. So we have joy in that comfort, knowing that God has provided something real and tangible. We're not waiting for this warm fuzzy from God so that we feel comforted. No, we have real physical human beings that can speak into our lives and be the hands and feet of God. So we have joy in that comfort. We also have joy in what God gives to us. Look at verse 12. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Haputch. She just went by Karen. And in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his sons and his son's sons for four generations. He doesn't just get spiritual comfort from God. He gets material comfort from God. Now, again, remember, this is a process. This isn't something that happens overnight. God gives these things. Again, you wouldn't have seven sons and three daughters just like that. That takes time. These things come back to him over time, and the whole time he's experiencing God's faithfulness. Many of you think that your happily ever after should be right now. 
I should live in the happily ever after right now. The, thing, the truth of the matter is, we're all kind of in process. Some of you, work right now is fantastic, couldn't be better. Home life, kind of stinks. Or it's vice versa. Home couldn't be better and you hate your job. Or maybe you're missing a significant other, but you have great friends and you have a promising career. We should be joyful and thankful for the things that God has given us, even if everything's not as it should be, even if everything is not right in the world. There are still things that are right that God has given us and blessed us with and poured out into our lives that we can respond in joy. Now, are there seasons to lament and, and weep over the things that you lost and don't have? Absolutely. If you've not been here for the last six weeks, I don't know what we've talked about. It's Job. But there are also seasons, and we talked about this last week, where you need to tell your heart, look, heart, I know you're not feeling like rejoicing right now, but darn it, we're going to rejoice. Because we are not destitute. We have blessing from God. We have experienced Him. He's spoken to us. And there are things to be thankful for. We can weep and wail tomorrow. Today we're going to rejoice and celebrate what God has done. You don't trust your heart. Don't let your heart tell you what to do. You tell it what we're going to do. And you rejoice. And you celebrate what God has done. Nothing wrong with weeping and grieving. It is wrong if it chokes out every bit of single joy that you have in your life without recognizing that God has poured out things into your life that are good. If the only thing you have to thank God for is the breath in your lungs, then that's worth worshiping for. It's worth worshiping for. And then we have joy that doesn't end. We have joy that doesn't end. I love verse 17. And Job died an old man full of days. Job, Job died an old man and full of days. This is basically the Old Testament way of saying, and they all lived happily ever after. There's going to be an end to our story. It's going to come to a close. Revelation 21 and a bunch of other places talks about what that end looks like. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, is going to return. He's going to come back to us. The king will return. And he's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth and those of us who are in Christ will rise from the dead and have new bodies. Those of us that are still alive will be transformed. And we will live in a new heaven and a new earth with God forever. And Revelation 21 tells us that, behold, the dwelling of God is with man. God will be here with us. So it's going to be one big, long, hi, how are you? I'm Yahweh. And then we're going to get to know him face to face for eternity. And that's the end. And at the end, all these things that are wrong in our world are going to stop being wrong. There's not going to be any more people running into schools and synagogues shooting them up. That's done. And it's going to be redeemed. There's not going to be moments in your life where you're like, I don't even know who I am anymore. That's done. Because in the light of Christ, you will know who you are. You are beloved, chosen of God. There's not going to be seasons of distress between you and other people because those have been healed and mended. And even though we might remember those things, they will not define our relationships because our relationship will be divine, defined by the right relationship we have with God. There's going to be an end to premature deaths, never realized dreams. There's going to be an end to racism and genocide. All these things are coming to an end and we will live with God forever full of days, rejoicing happily ever after. And then James chapter 5, verse 7 fills us in on what this looks like to a greater extent. Because Revelation 21, 7 tells us that this gift is for those who persevere. Look at chapter 5 of James, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Skip down to verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider the, those blessed who've remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This gift, this end, is for those who persevere, who remain steadfast like Job. You can ask questions. You can question God. You can question your friends. You can question all sorts of things, but don't give up. And when God finally does speak, and He has spoken, respond with confession. Let Him know who He is. Worship Him. 
Let him know who you are and be like, God, I'm your servant, and I am not equal with you, and I am here to worship. Be satisfied with who he is. Then be obedient. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, if you don't have a relationship with him, you've got to take care of that today. You can't wait. Stop it. Stop waiting. Come join us in the next steps room. We'll talk. Come over there. Maybe you need to settle down and join a church. Maybe that's why you don't experience the comfort of God is because you church hop. You're going to be somewhere else next week. If you're in town, you should be here. Our church is just as good as anybody else's. We have flaws and we have really good things. Every church does. So commit to this one. It's a good place. God is working. And then we rejoice. We rejoice together. The band's going to come back up here. We're going, to, we're going to sing. And I want you to think about the fact that God has spoken. What is your confession? How can you obey? And then let's rejoice and celebrate together. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you so much because you have spoken. And you have spoken through your word, through your son, and through creation. We know about you. We know who you are. So God, thank you for who you are. And thank you for making us, creating us, And having a place for us, God, I pray that you would forgive us when we rebel against you, Lord. We're satisfied in you. I pray that you would give us today the things that we can do to show you worship, to show you that we love you and to love others. And God, please make in our heart the greatest joy it can be to give you worship. So God, I pray that you would be praised and glorified now as we sing together. It's in your son's name. Amen.